One Dental Clinic, sponsors of Women Today, offer convenient appointment times in the heart of Douglas, so you can fit your dental care into your working day. And this afternoon, we are talking chips, cheese and gravy with Georgie Revel from Cook Shack and Shirley Callow from Isle of Man Creameries. Uh, lots of people getting in touch about this. I'm going to be honest, there haven't been many people in favour of this dish yet. <gasps> um, this texter says, I think it's pretty embarrassing that such an unhealthy meal is thought of as our national dish. What sort of image does it project? I will never ever accept it oh my word well interestingly <laughs> georgie's been looking into the nutritional side because it does get quite a bad rap is it as bad oh sorry Beth. well I, I, we've just got a couple of more oh, texts on, on that on. theme and then okay. maybe georgie then can address georgie. them all. Okay. okay um howard says while i think it does look i'm, I'm going to apologize actually if anybody's still eating okay so just you know you might want to just stick your fingers in your ears just saying. Uh, Howard says, while I think it looks a bit like dog sick and actually ruins a good bag of chips, there should really have been a special evening to celebrate the dish on Isle of Man Railways or even Gradle Glen. People could then have jumped on the chips, cheese and gravy train. Oh. Um, and this texter says, chips, cheese and gravy is commonly known in Canada as gut rot peasant food or poutine as it gives you the runs. But it is our very proud national dish. This is because our chefs have no imagination or creative flair. I find I get constipation when I consume this slop. Many thanks. <laughs> what oh. is going on? Oh. Right, so what's Have the deal? Do, you know do you know why we've not no. got positive ones? Because they're all down the chip shop yeah, getting, fit, getting their it. chips, cheese and gravy. <laughs> okay, That's so why. is it as bad for us as people think? Well, it all depends on how you make your chips, cheese and gravy, isn't it? I mean, you've got um, your average dish has 26 grams of protein. So that's good. Yep, there are, we'll just uh, gloss over this, 12 grams grams of saturated fats. You need um, some fats though, don't you? But you've you? got, yeah. you know, you've got um, <laughs> potassium, uh, you've got your carbs, okay, little fibre, yeah. But uh, it, it's a dish that everybody can afford. Hi, my name is Rachel Miles. I am a creative at BBC Creative, so I come up with ideas for adverts. I was born here um, on the island and then I grew up in Tremode with my fam and kind of went round sticking my head out of my dad's Land Rover Defender <laughs> in the countryside. But yeah, I was born over here and then I went to Moyes Road and then and did multimedia at the Isle of Man College. I didn't, I didn't want to do A-levels. I just knew that wasn't for me. Just kind of wanted to get on with it. And and what was it about multimedia that really interested you? I was always interested in behind the scenes of things. I used to, I used to watch SMTV Live, Top of the Pops. Be like, how, like, how do they, how do they do that? <laughs> From that, I just went to college, did multimedia, really, really started doing editing. Um, And then from that, went to Central St. Martin's University, where I studied advertising. And how well do you think that the course at UCM prepared you? Oh, it was amazing. I I actually do think that was better than St. Martin's. Sometimes I think, oh, did I really need to go to uni? Or should I have gone to another university like in Australia or New York, you know? But no, I I don't have any regrets because I wouldn't have met my creative partner, Michael, if I didn't go to St. Martin's. So you went to, did the course at at St. Martin's and you you mentioned your creative partner. What, What happened next? So Michael and I completed uni and then you have to do some placements to kind of get your foot in the door. So on the last day of university, we got picked up by an ad company called VCCP and they do all the O2 ads and um, quite quite juicy clients. But it wasn't the right fit for us. It was quite, it was quite boring. Um, and then London isn't the cheapest place. So I came home to save some money, worked in film, worked on Bell and our robot overlords. And then I got an email one day from BNB ad agency, which is owned by Trevor Beatty, who's going into space. Um, I think he bought the first ticket. I think he's hoping to sit next to Angelina Jolie as well. Um, and 
we were on placement there, kept getting extended, and we we were briefed with the Thompson holiday brief, and we're told if you crack this, you know, that's that's a job. So we worked really hard, worked Sundays, worked weekends, wouldn't finish till 11 p.m. at night, which is fine. Because <laughs> when you really want something, you just, you just so passionate, you just go for it. We put our idea in the mix and then it was really, really liked. And then, yeah, who would have thought we would actually open on a beach in Jamaica, you know? Oh um, my goodness. Yeah. So when you're part of that process and you come up with the brief, I mean, how much input do you have from that point onwards? We get given a brief, which is done by a planner, and then the client, Thompson in that case, you know, would have input to on what they wanted to achieve that year. And then from the idea of we open on a beach in Jamaica, you know, I only put that because my brother, you know, is really into that Rastafarian culture, and I was like, where would I want to go? So, yeah, and then when the client, Thompson, was like, yep, yeah, OK, we'll do it. Um, So from then, got got to choose a director so we went with Tom Taghom who had just done the Superhumans ad for Channel 4 so from that we chose the cast so Emily um, we chose as the little girl we had to design the bears and we got seven of them made and all the costumes so if you know if you watch the ad again the costumes kind of change colour palette so in the sad beginning they're all kind of blues and greys and then when you go into the second half, whether in Jamaica, it's all very pink and bright and happy. Nation Station, Manx Radio. Next month is the annual Fair Trade Fortnight. Now, this is a campaign that increases awareness about fair trade goods and also, crucially, the people who produce them. Here on the island, the One World Centre takes charge of organising events, and we are joined by coordinator Win- Wendy Shimon. Sorry, I don't know what I was going to say there. Uh, so lovely that you're here with us, Wendy. Um, just explain what is fair trade, first of all. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me here today. And I should say that we actually do have an Isle of Man Fair Trade Group, of which I'm a member as well. Uh, So I wouldn't like the One World Centre to take all the credit. Um, So Fair Trade, um, at its most simplest, it's a programme of certification that ensures that producers get paid a fair price. It's really that simple. Um, When you think about Fair Trade products, uh, the majority of them are produced, farmed in developing countries. And so often over the years, uh, the farmers have really not been recompensed for what they do. So fair trade is a way of ensuring that, A, they receive a minimum price for what they grow, uh, and B, also um, ensures they get something called the fair trade premium, which is an extra little bit of money that they can use in their community to either make their businesses more sustainable or on some kind of community venture, which might be um, a school or a health clinic or something something that they they need in their community. And is there one sort of organisation that oversees all of this and makes sure that these things are put in place? Yes, so the fair trade movement is worldwide, uh, but what we're talking about here and what the renewal status for the Isle of Man was, was all about fair trade, uh, the fair trade certification, which um, if you find a fair trade produced item you'll find the little logo on the bottom of it which is actually a person waving sometimes people don't actually realize what the picture means but it's a a picture of uh, somebody waving that says fair trade on it you know then that that has been certified and that the farmer who produced that chocolate that tea that coffee whatever it may be has been paid um, a fair price. So the island Wendy has fair trade status and this as you say has just been renewed so this is a really good thing for the island we're we're right there with this. It's an excellent thing we've actually had the fair trade island status since 2008 um, uh, and we've managed to renew it every two years uh, to show that we are still committed to it. Does somebody come over and do an examination or how how does Uh, that work to get the renewal? (laughs) We have to produce some evidence so we put together each two years you put together a plan of what you're hoping to do and how you're going to try and promote it and get more people to support fair trade and then you need to sort of show some evidence as to what what's actually happened. uh, this year, actually, we've just had a fair trade conference for primary school children, which we run every year and is one of the ways that we promote fair trade on the island. And we were lucky this year to have uh, Bruce Crowther come over to be our keynote speaker. And Bruce was the founder of the fair trade town movement. Um, he comes from a place called Garstang in Lancashire. Uh, and I can't quite remember when they became a, a fair trade town. I think it was probably about around about 2000. 
they started off as just uh, three people wanting to do something about fair trade and they took Garstang into the first fair trade town. He then came over in 2008 to help us with uh, getting an initial status and it was really nice to have him back again last week to talk to the children at the conference uh, and also acknowledge the renewal status that we've got again. And is there any indication as to how many people in the Isle of Man would opt for fair trade products? Uh, it's a bit hard to put a number on it. Um, there's certainly lots of scope to take up fair trade. People tend to think uh, of the traditional products that uh, we know of, uh, tea, chocolate, coffee, sugar. Um, but there's actually over 4,000 different products now that are produced and have fair trade certification. Um, we've got some fabulous outlets on the Isle of Man. Um, if you're uh, a wine buff, you know, the co-op has, all the co-ops have a fantastic fair trade wine rage. Um, most of the supermarkets will have fair trade stocks. We've got the Shakti Man shop up in Ramsey that's got an amazing range of fair trade items. So but there's an awful lot of ways that you can contribute to fair trade. The but as I mentioned, this week marks the 35th anniversary of a picture book, which has helped countless parents deal with talking to their children about the difficult subject of death. Badger's Parting Gifts was first published in 1984, and the story revolves around Badger, who is so old that he knows he's going to die soon, and so does his best to prepare his friends. When he does die, they are all really upset. But one by one, they remember the special things he taught them during his life. And by sharing their memories, they realise that although Badger is no longer with them physically, he does live on through his friends. After his death, all the friends come together, they describe their emotions, share their feelings. And so this book really does give children the opportunity to recognise and share their own experiences and also hopefully feel that it's good to talk about special times they might have had with someone who's died. The charity Child Bereavement UK also works to break the taboo of talking about death and I've been talking to the Director of Bereavement Services there, Anne Rowland, and first, the book's author, Susan Varley. But it didn't conceal the sadness that Badger's friends felt. Badger had always been there when anyone needed him. The animals all wondered what they would do now that he was gone. I'm Susan Varley. I have to confess it wasn't my idea. Um, it was the idea of my tutor at the time, a man called Tony Ross, who's also a children's author and illustrator. Um, and he'd seen a picture of my badgers. Um, and he'd had an idea of about a badger who dies running round in his head. And he didn't really know what to do with it. So he said, well, if you can do some with it, you can have the story. Um, so my grandmother had died about six months before that. Um, it was the first time I'd really been affected by death. So I, I thought, yes, I can probably do something like this. But we never imagined that it would be published and certainly not talking about it 35 years later. And the fact is, is that this really does introduce the subject of death to children and really guides parents and guardians in talking to them about it. How helpful did you find it from your own point of view of dealing with your grandmother's death, of actually putting perhaps some of your feelings into this book? I think it helps an awful lot, actually. Um, there's a lot of grandma in there, really, you know, in the character of the badger. And certainly there's certain things in the illustration that, that are definitely grandma. So, yes, I didn't think about it at the time, but I'm, it must have helped. Yes, it must have done. The group of children from Peel Cloth Workers School are taking on the TT course to raise money for Monitors for Kids. Now, that charity works with the Manx Diabetic Group to raise enough money to pay for a pain-free alternative to finger prick blood testing because children with diabetes can have to test their blood 10 to 15 times a day. So it's really great uh, that these Year 4s from Cloth Workers are supporting this charity. They're all 8 and 9 years old and they won't be just doing one lap of the TT course. They're actually aiming for three. However, they will be staying well away from the roads, you'll be glad to hear, and instead they're going to be swimming the equivalent distance. At the Western Swim Pool we do a TT swim challenge every year where we invite people to join and they have to swim the length of the TT course, so in total it works out at 2,416 lengths, which is equal to about 200 a week because we do it over 12 weeks. And how many people have you got doing this? We've got about 60 this year. This is our eighth year. Um, last year we did it for Swim Safe, so we raised money for Swim Safe. Um, this year we're going to do it for the monitors for kids. The Nation Station. 
you were listening to yesterday's show, you may have heard the Year 4 pupils from Peel Cloth Workers School who are taking on the TT Swim Challenge to raise money for charity. And that charity is Monitors for Kids, and that's raising money to pay for a pain-free alternative to finger brick testing for children with diabetes. The local accountancy firm KPMG is supporting a fundraising event for Monitors for Kids on February the 10th. And Justine Howard uh, from KPMG is with us. And we'll talk much more about the event um, a little bit later, Justine. But first of all, why did you want to get involved? Why did KPMG want to get involved with Monitors for Kids? Um, we um, we have a chosen charity that we um, support every year. And actually the staff voted um, to support the Manx Diabetic Group and particularly the uh, Monitors for Kids campaign. Um, so um, it's it's a it's a group decision really to support it, and I've been on the um, the citizenship committee for for four or five years now, so that's how I've been involved. Wonderful. We'll talk more about what's happening uh, on February the tenth in just a moment. But we are also joined this afternoon by Manx Pro cyclist Sam Brand, who was diagnosed with type one diabetes partway through his final year at primary school. Sam, thank you so much for taking the time to be here this afternoon. What do you remember about that time around the time you were diagnosed? Uh, not a lot really um, I kind of don't really remember a time before being diagnosed now so um, it's kind of happened as a blur I had my parents kind of took on a lot of responsibility at that age I didn't really know what was happening um, have much experience with uh, diabetes in general let alone type 1 or 2 so um, it was kind of a, um, a shock because at school I don't think there was anybody else with diabetes so uh, it was all um sort of a new ball game trying to learn out trying to work out everything from there but uh no I don't really remember a lot but uh I'm still here now so what did it mean for you on a practical level you know on a day-to-day basis because some of the things we've been hearing about is that the number of times you have to do the finger prick test for example do you remember much about that yeah I remember uh, actually the first time I went back into school after uh, being diagnosed and um everyone was inquisitive about my um blood monitor so it was kind of like learning to do that I mean at that time I was doing it about 10 times a day um with this new um technology the CGM it's it some of them the one I use takes away the need for testing so I were going from testing 10 times a day to having live feed of my blood sugar continuously throughout the day and how do you get that information uh, I get that information either on an app through my phone or through my device. So it's just in my back pocket um, when I'm out riding. It's in my jersey pocket and it's just uh, gives a live stream every five minutes. I get a, a new reading and it gives trends so I can see if I'm going up or down or, or flat. So for me, it's undoubtedly the best piece of technology that it, that is available. 